and welcome back to Crimes from the East, your Desi true crime podcast, and also a strange phenomenon podcast. Hi, it's me. Hey, that's Alex. Interrupting Alex. Interrupting Alex. So, Alex, what have you been up to? Well, I'm in the middle of nowhere, deep in the mountains of the desert in Arizona. So, there's definitely a lag because I can't get good Wi-Fi out here, and I don't know why. And I'm pretty sure it's because the government is hiding aliens in my backyard. So, they don't want people (laughs) to have too much access. It's too much. There's too much going on. It's literally impossible. All right, so Alex has turned her camera off to improve her internet quality, and I am talking into the void. Nice. You I feel are like a radio host. sleepy. Listen to the sound of my voice. Anyways. Hey, so you watch anything cool lately? My mom has been late at night revisiting all of some Indian actor who recently Passed away, Deepa something. Oh, no, no, Dilip Kumar. Dilip Kumar. Deepa? Yeah, <laughs> Deepa. She also recently called me out on my whole goat story. She claims that I have, like, appropriated her story from Africa, so. I have to hear this from her, but what's what's her version of it? What's her version of it? Well, she's making this very, like, very firm claim that in India... Men don't ask for, don't offer dowry. It's the women who are supposed to offer dowry. So it's Mm -hmm. impossible that anyone would have wanted to sell any goats to me. So like, I'm actually worth zero goats from the start, which (laughs) is a, you know, huge disappointment. But you forget one thing, Alex. Yeah. You're half Indian, but you're kind of white. I mean, in the eyes of Indians, that Desi goat herder, (laughs) you're a white girl. So maybe he was trying to buy you because he's like, ooh, I like that shiny thing. I mean, that's how I remember it. But my mom claims that actually she was the one who (laughs) offered herself for a certain number of goats when she was living in Africa. So it's like backwards on every freaking level. Maybe that was just a synchronicity and the both of you had these goat related trade agreements. Hashtag goat vibes. Goat vibes. Um, Yeah, so she's been watching a lot of movies from this guy, and they have been recolorized, and Mm -hmm. I have not watched anything. He was a good actor, Dilip Kumar. He was a good actor, and he did work in a lot of really good movies. From what I read, in his personal life, he was actually a nasty, narcissistic, vindictive jerk. Sounds like an actor, am I right? (laughs) Exactly, (laughs) yeah. All right, he's dead. Let's move on. Yeah. Well, I have just been watching more and more UFO documentaries and, you know, all kinds of different topics surrounding the UFO. Uh, The latest one I watched was the History Channel's coverage of the weird activities that happen on the Skinwalker Ranch. Have you heard about that? Oh, yeah. Skinwalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can thank our boys at Less Podcast for that one. That was such a good series. I can't remember the name of that funny dog creature that Henry voiced. Do you remember? Oh, no. I'm definitely re-listening to that soon. Last podcast, Skinwalker Dog. What was his name? Bonko. Bonko the Everything Dog. (laughs) Bonko the Everything Dog. That was so hilarious. (laughs) It kind of ruined a lot of parts in this documentary for me because I was when they were talking about this ferocious giant creature that comes out and attacks their cattle. All in my head, I'm thinking of that Bonko, the (laughs) Bonko the Everything Dog. Going like, oh, I'm just here to get some goats. I want to go there. That's in Nevada, right? It's private property. No, it's in Utah. I'm going to drive by. Uh-uh-uh. It's so close and it's so far. I highly recommend if anyone wants something interesting to watch. I think it's called The Hunt for Skinwalker Ranch, made okay. by the History Channel. It's on uh, Hulu. But we're not getting to UFOs yet, right? Um, Alex, you, you ready? You ready for today's episode? I'm just like five seconds behind you, I think, but I'm totally ready. Okay, so 
to the untrained eye, it, it might look like we're back in Bengal again oh! for this episode. But wait, wait, we are actually sailing into the Bay of Bengal. Our hastily crafted raft, clearly not suitable for this journey, brings us 800 miles southeast of India to the humble-looking islands of Andaman and Nicobar, an archipelago of more than 800 islands spanning across 450 miles out in the Andaman Sea. Sounds nice. We come upon the island of Port Blair, the largest developed city in the group of islands. The Andamans were so far out from the shore back in the day that the British from the East India Company built a huge gulag here in 1896 called Cellular Jail or Kalapani in Hindi. Okay. Meaning black stone. And it was a horrible prison housing the most notorious criminals as well as high-profile political prisoners from the Indian independence movement. When they had spent enough years locked up in solitary confinement, they were walked to the gallows to a bitter end. So it was a horrible, horrible place. Yeah. You just went here to die, basically. Were these guys actually prisoners, though, or were they just, like, rebelling against, you know, oppression and (laughs) enslavement and all that? It was a mix of both. There were convicts of gruesome crimes here. Okay. Thugs, which hopefully we'll cover one day. And also political prisoners who were fighting for India's independence at that time. There was a big mutiny in India in 1857, which kicked off the independence movement unofficially. Okay. And so there were prisoners in this jail from that movement, the high-profiled mutineers, you know, if you would like to call them that. Okay. Because this rock is so far away from the mainland, this was ideal. Mm Mm-hmm. Obviously, today, the cellular jail isn't a functioning prison of doom like Azkaban, but it is a historical museum that you can tour. There are some very beautiful beaches, crystal clear blue waters and coconut trees lighting the shores, underplayed island life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the razzy, snazzy, high-flying resort town like Cancun or something. Yet another hidden gem of India that we're exposing to the world (laughs) just to let the world ruin it. (laughs) (laughs) Don't go there. Please, people, forget about what I just said. (laughs) Forget about Andamans. Don't go there. Go to Goa. It's ruined already. Go go there again. Bleep out all of the location names. (laughs) Yeah, just go to Goa. Goa. Just go to Goa, yeah. Goa. Andamans is a picture of serenity and a place to experience some of the simpler joys of life Minus the Wi-Fi, because they don't have good cell service on the islands. That alone will filter out all the millennials (laughs) and younger crowds. So I think I think we're good. Port Blair isn't our final destination today, though, Alex. Oh, no. Mm -mm, It was just a little pit stop. So let's push off on our ruddy raft and navigate to the northwest. You see that little round island up there? Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. one strange, overgrown, and seemingly uninhabited island? Mm -hmm. That's where we're going. Where are we? We are in the world's most dangerous little landmass. The North Sentinel Island. Have you heard about this place? I think I heard a news report about it back a few years ago. It rings the faintest of bells. That's good. I get to tell you a lot of things about it in that case. The North Sentinel Island is a protected zone and you cannot get within five nautical miles of its shores by law of the Indian government. Now, why is this island so closely guarded? It's because the 23 square mile North Sentinel Island is home to one of the last surviving pre-Neolithic groups of humans on Earth. Can I ask a stupid question? Yeah, go ahead. What does pre-Neolithic entail? History me. From a time before agriculture and domestication of animals was adopted by humans some 12,000 odd years ago. Okay. Oh, shit. Rapid developments in behavior, culture, and technology took place in the Neolithic era some 10,000 odd years ago in the Levant region of the planet. Now, Levant or Levante means rising in Italian, also known as Al-Mushrik. In Arabic. Ooh. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know why, but this this was mentioned in Wikipedia, so I'm, I'm saying it here. Which means the eastern place. <laughs> Would we be the crimes from the old Mashriq? <sighs> Sounds cool, right? Crimes <laughs> from the old Mashriq. Sounds like we could get blacklisted for that. The NSA will be listening to all our episodes and bumping mm-hmm. up our uh, bumping up our numbers. I love that. <laughs> the Levant region is generally believed to be current day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus. This is where we as humans had a spark in our evolution mm-hmm. as a species. And we went from rugged, crude existence in the Stone Age to a more advanced creature in the Neolithic Age. The beginning of the end. (laughs) Look at what's happening in Syria today. Just devastation all around. The cradle of advancement is now in tatters. Yeah. Historically, these regions have always been stricken with conflict. All of these places that I just mentioned. Yeah. It makes me wonder why. Definitely, yeah, some bad juju. Is there some hidden ancient power source there that the warring entities are fighting to control? There's something there. Okay, I've officially digressed into kooky stuff. Kooky 3 a.m. type of speculation. Conspiracy land. (laughs) Okay, let's get back to our little island. Mm -hmm. The Sentinelese, or Sentinelese, are still in the Stone Age in most regards. So they did not get the memo <laughs> when <laughs> when developments took place in that Levant region. I wonder why. That's such a mean girl's move, isn't it? <laughs> People in the mainland were like, whoops, that's the wheel. Hey, you want to tell those guys over there on the, on the islands? Nah. Uh, nah. That's all right. They don't sit on our table. Nah. The Sentinelese or Sentinelli are generally between 5 feet 3 inches and 5 feet 5 inches tall. They display insular dwarfism, which is common among small island inhabitants. Okay. Tribes like these are also referred to as pygmy tribes. Yeah. I think that's probably an obsolete term. So the Sentinelese have dark, radiant skin, short curly hair, and are generally quite muscular. They show no signs of obesity at all. (laughs) Unlike, I mean, <laughs> us. That's one of the amazing side effects of agricultural evolution, I guess. So advanced. Look at all our flab. So advanced. Oh. Mwah. You know, our, our shitty skin problems and our scanty hair and all these flabs. Just reeking of advancement. So advanced. Like mega advanced. All right. Those poor ripped savages. That's terrible. Believed to have migrated from Africa 50,000 years ago. And this is, of course, generationally, not that they set out 50,000 years ago and reached these islands 50,000 years ago. Yeah. But over time, humans migrated out of Africa, which is the current prevailing theory about human migration. Some people don't believe that, by Mm -hmm. the way. And I don't know what else, what. What's the alternative? What what the hell do you think we came from? Where do you think we came from? The aliens, you know, planted their eggs all over the planet. Maybe they did plant the eggs, but they planted it in Africa. And then that's where we all came from. One of the science scientists use the genetic diversity inside of Africa as evidence for that theory, because you see more genetic diversity inside of Africa than you do outside, which Mm -hmm. means... Humans evolved inside of that subcontinent. So, okay. Mm-hmm. The Sentinelli are hunter-gatherers who are still very much a Stone Age people with some skills in tools and weapon making, but nothing too exotic. They use bows and arrows, spears, and staffs. Their weapons are often tipped with metal, now scavenged from the shoreline around the island. Wow, interesting. They don't do any metal forging or mining or anything like that. But they found enough to, like, create a a salvaging craft. They're off of the coast of India. Can you just imagine the trash that's washing up on their shores? It's a veritable bounty. Castaway Tom Hanks would have been, like, he would have just stayed on the island if he had that much trash trash resource. (laughs) Yeah. Before 10,000 BC, the land masses were much higher than they are today and sea levels were super low. 
-hmm. The Andaman Islands were probably connected to the mainland via Burma or Myanmar. That's probably how that group gradually migrated into that area, the Andaman and Nicobar. But once the polar ice caps melted, the sea levels rose and turned the Andamans into a more isolated, cut-off island in the ocean. Okay. So if you can imagine that, connected at first, and then the water yeah. level rises up, and now you're out in the ocean all by <laughs> yourself. The ice caps did them dirty. How long does that take to happen, though? At some point, you must realize, oh, we can't get to land without crossing some water now. Maybe we should, like, get our shit and go to the other side. But why would you move? If you have everything you need to survive in a place... Yeah. Like, eh, I can't visit Ernie from, you know, whatever, 10 islands over that often as I used to 10 years ago. Right. But that's okay. You know, I can hunt. I can fish. I can survive yeah. on my little island. I, I don't want to move. Did you say how big the island is? <laughs> yep. It's 23 square miles. Okay. Yeah. You don't need much more than that. It's not that big, but it's big enough for a small group to survive well. So the sentinel diet is thought to consist mainly of eggs, fish, mollusks, snail, squid, and mud crabs, turtles, and wild boars, as well as birds. Okay. Although there has obviously never been any consensus taken officially, estimations on the total headcount of the tribesmen is anywhere from 50 to 500. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a total like ballpark guesstimate to me. Shot in the dark. 50 or 500. We don't know. I would really like to see like a live stream of a drone going there though. <laughs> Counting the people like one. Two, and then they hide and come out. Three, no, wait, maybe that was the first guy again. And at some point, the drone's definitely going to get ambushed and, like, brutally impaled. Oh, yeah. When I tell you, you know, what's happened on that island, that, that drone is toast. Done for. Sentinel Island, where does this name come from? The British. But we're calling them Sentinelese? Oh, because we, like, don't even know what they call themselves? We have no idea what they call themselves. So we've just stuck with the name the British gave them. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. The Sentinelese people are related to other indigenous groups in the Andaman Islands. So this isn't the only island where there were native indigenous populations of Negrito people like the mm -hmm. Sentinelese. They are related to other indigenous groups on the chain of islands in India's Bay of Bengal. But... They've been isolated for so long and long enough that other Andaman groups like the Onge and the Jarava mm -hmm. have languages that do not overlap theirs. So other tribes don't understand what the Sentinelese say and vice versa. Wow. So even though they live just miles away from each other, their languages are not common or overlapping. Although the other tribes do seem to understand each other to some extent. Because they've been living much closer to each other over thousands of years. Okay. Although a severely isolated tribe, they're not entirely uncontacted. Like the Sentinelese, there were other tribes in the Andaman, like the Jarava and the Onge, who were contacted by outsiders several times over the last century and eventually partially assimilated into society. Not successfully, though. Mm-hmm. To fully understand the past and the future of the Sentinelese, we need to look at what happened with these other tribes from the islands. And there are lessons to be learned here and much history to kind of understand why they're so hostile to everyone. Okay. Yeah. So first off, there is a big distinction between the people of the Andaman Islands and those of the Nicobar Islands, the latter of which are more to the south. So, the Nicobar Islands are geographically closer to Indonesia and Malaysia than they are to India. Nicobar is merely 93 miles from Sumatra, Indonesia. Have you been there? Mm, I don't think so. I've been to Indonesia, but and I went to the Thousand Islands. Is that Nicobar, actually? No. No, Nicobar is part of India, so if you went to Indonesia, I don't think... You would have gone to Nicobar yeah, from no, there. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. 
So the Nicobarese are an Austro-Asiatic people. Okay, they're different from the people of the Andaman. So the, the tribes on the Andaman Islands are Negrito people, which means they have black skin, curly hair, you know, African features. Okay. But the Nicobaris are Austro-Asiatic people who look more like Southeast Asians. Mm-hmm. And they speak Khmer, Mon Khmer mm-hmm. languages. Uh, those spoken in mainland Southeast Asia and parts of India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and China. So some of these languages, specifically Khmer, yeah. which is spoken in Cambodia, was heavily influenced by Sanskrit and Pali, by the way. I went to, was it in Cambodia? No. Where'd you go? He was in Laos. I went to this place called the Buddha Park. Mm-hmm. And it was a like pretty old park that was just full of Buddhas, but the Buddhas were really like mixed with like Hindu, mm. uh, more provincial like deities. There was such a hodgepodge. Like for some reason, there were several statues of like Krishna and Kali and probably um, lots of Hanuman. Yeah, there was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was a interesting like demonstration of how those two religions really got mixed and mashed in this area. Hinduism and Buddhism spread a lot uh, back in the day, you know, to countries in Southeast Asia. Feels like we're all part of one big Daisy family, isn't it? I love that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have been to Cambodia. And we went to the Angkor Wat, which is, you know, one of the wonders of the world. And it is a Hindu temple complex, right? It is, I believe, a temple dedicated to Lord Vishnu. And yeah, just the whole place. There's like sculptures of uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana all over the place. It's so weird. Mm-hmm. I'm in Cambodia and I'm looking at Anuman. What's going on? Like, it's so weird to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also pretty cool. And of course, we know that Bali is a Hindu island. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the Wikipedia articles and most reports about the Andamans and Nicobar always mention the British as being... Like the first to sail there back in the day. But hello, the colonial invaders didn't invent sailing. Yeah. (laughs) Indian sailors were navigating those waters hundreds of years before them. It just goes to show how history is written by the rulers and we must do our parts to undo that. Mm. So. Amen. I mean, Hare Krishna. Huh? What, What did he say, Alex? Amen. And then I said, I mean, Hare Krishna. Yeah, Ram Ram. Okay, so there is mention of Nicobar Islands in the 3rd century Sri Lankan Buddhist chronicles as Nagadipa, which means island of naked people. There's also mention of the islands in the Indian Tamilian Chola Empire records in Tanjavur. There's an inscription there dating back to 1050, so that's 1050 CE. There, the name of this island is Nakkavaram, or Land of the Naked. That's so cool. Like, so Sri Lanka and Tamil Nadu, they both mentioned this island as Island of Naked People. They must have been very shocked. Like, why aren't they wearing clothes? What's going on? You know, every time I hear Nag anything, I immediately think snakes. So I was hoping that it was going to be Island of the Snakes. I bet there's tons of snakes. Island of the Naked People sounds fun, too. They're naked and unafraid. Mm -hmm. Marco Polo, the Portuguese explorer, also references these islands as Necuveran in his writings from the 12th century. Necuveran. Necuveran. So, Nakavaram became Necuveran. Necuveran. Yeah, Necuveran. The Dutch attempted to settle in Nicobar but failed owing to malaria outbreaks. They did still maintain rights over the islands, which they then sold to the British in 1868. I mean, how convenient. (laughs) The Dutch just landed there, put a flag down, and they're like, yep, this is ours. Ours. It's all Dutch. So Dutch looking. Like the culture, the Dutch (laughs) culture just pouring out of the dirt. I really feel at home here. This is so Dutchy. It does seem 
that while part of Nicobar was visited by these travelers, um, that the Andamans were not as well documented before this time by other, okay. you know, by other cultures. But there are a few mentions of it. The Andamans are mentioned in the 13th century Chinese Song Dynasty text, where they were referred to as Yuntuoman. Kind of sounds Yun- like Andaman, right? Yuntuoman. 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 It sounds like Andaman, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah Yuntuoman. Yeah. This was part of a book called Zhu Fan Zi, written by Zhao Rugua. I apologize in advance if I've said all these words wrong. I, I know nothing of Mandarin at all. I apologize. All I know is that I also don't know how to say anything in Mandarin. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Eve. This book was translated into English as, are you ready for it? Yeah. A description of barbarian nations, records of foreign people. Sounds nice. Sounds really very friendly. <laughs> Thank you to all of the writers from that time for recording our ancestry for future generations, even though they were a little rude. Hope the plague didn't get you too bad. In 1789, the British established a penal colony on Port Blair, but disease brought death to the settlement, it was abandoned within a decade. Throughout the early 1800s, smaller crews of ships which landed on the adjacent Andaman Islands were attacked and killed by the native people. The Andamanese tribes were not screwing around. They're like, you land here, we'll kill you. Do not. (laughs) Do not. Come here. I just have this gut feeling that we're entering into a cannibal holocaust situation. I don't know if you've heard of or seen this movie. I haven't. There was like a big conspiracy at some point. I guess it came out in what, like the 60s or 70s and people thought that it was real. Oh, no. And it like did a lot of damage to the indigenous like people of this area. I'm pretty sure it was Central or South America, but Mm. I watched it and there's definitely a vibe of like just hostile hostility. And I'm getting the same feeling that that's coming. We're painting them as the bad guys when we're the ones that are encroaching on their territory. Yeah. (laughs) They're totally justified in their reactions, whatever they may be. Not everyone has to be friendly. Yep. Any country will want to defend its borders from outsiders. And they were doing exactly the same. It's also just like a natural, like group animal instinct too and humans are animals as much as that might rub people the wrong way and you know taken out of the quote-unquote evolutions and revolutions that's what it comes down to it's all about resources and usually resources are limited because you have to work so hard you gotta protect your shit to freaking climb trees to pluck fruits and run around all day, wake up at three in the morning to go hunting. Ugh, what a pain in the ass. Like You don't want yeah. more and more people coming in for sure. So it makes sense that they would be hostile. Let someone try and eat my food without me giving them permission first. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make noise. It's not going to be nice. There will be very annoying noises. Touch my banana chips. You're getting a spear in the butt. <laughs> in the butt. In the butt. In 1771, a British East India Company survey ship called the Diligent, sailing across the Andaman Sea, noticed bright lights which must have been campfires on the shores of the Sentinel Island. However, they wisely did not stop to investigate further. They're like, yeah, we see some lights. I'm sure they're, you know, indigenous people, whatever. We don't need this island, so let's go. They're probably just making maps at that point. Imagine. Almost a century later, the colonial Brits were getting restless for space, especially isolated spots they could control with impunity and little interference from dissenters of their imperial rule in India. Mm. Many of India's brave freedom fighters needed to be put away to quash their efforts. The Mm -hmm. Andaman Islands was the perfect location for building such a penal colony 
And that's exactly why the British started to land on these islands starting in the 1850s. They were settling on the island of Port Blair, the one that we were talking about earlier, which is the main big Andaman island. This would cause a lot of maritime traffic in that region, more traffic than ever before. The Brits encountered a lot of tribal folk on Port Blair, and they were perplexed by why their behavior was so unpredictable. One day they were super friendly, the next day they were hostile. Gradually, they learned that this was because they were dealing with several different tribes on the island and not just one group of people. Oh boy, that is so fun. (laughs) They probably all look the same to them. They're like, hey, I saw you yesterday. You were totally, you were shaking my hand and why are you slapping me in the face today? I was going to make that comment, but I just, it felt racist even saying it. It's actually a biological thing. You you can not distinguish fine features in a different race. It is a biological thing. If you're not thing. like used to being around it. This is maybe going to be a bad analogy, but it's like all cats kind of look the same until it's your cat. And then even if there's a cat that looks exactly like your cat, you're going to be able to identify your cat because you like see him all the time. Is that bad? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to cut that out. Shit. (laughs) I tried. This sounds like the premise of like some kind of slapstick comedy to me. Like these British people are so bamboozled. Like, what's going on over here? One day they love us, the next day they hate us. I could definitely imagine Mr. Bean. The great Andamanese tribes inhabited Port Blair for thousands of years. And while they did have similar languages and culture, they did maintain separate groups on the island. The sub-tribes were generally cordial but cautious of each other. And they did often marry into other groups to form closer bonds and ensure genetic diversity. So they're clearly smart and they know what they're doing. Estimates suggest the great Andamanese numbered anywhere between two to 6,000 when the British first arrived in the 1780s. Within 50 years of the establishment of the penal colony, their population had fallen from 6,000. Yeah, guess what number they fell to in 50 years. Oh, uh, 600. Yep, 625. Oh, shit. In 50 years. According to George Weber, the late scholar of the Andaman tribes, Four years after independence, in 1951, the number had plummeted to 25. Just think about that. In under two centuries, the number went from 6,000 to 25. That is a freaking flawless genocide. I mean, isn't two centuries kind of a long time, though? I don't know. We've done worse. We have. I mean, we as humans... No, but that's that's insane. That's crazy. I've used parts of George Weber's work on the tribes of the Andamans as source for the information presented here. So his website from 1997, which is archived by the Wayback Machine at this point, is very data rich. And anyone interested in anthropology, human migration, out of Africa theory, and of course, related studies about Andaman and the tribes of that region should definitely check out his work. Just Google George Weber Andaman. And of course, I'll add links to the website so you can go check it out there too. So George Weber said in a 2002 interview to the United Press, these pygmy Negrito people are a remnant population representing an early, perhaps the earliest migration out of Africa of modern Homo sapiens. Anthropologically, I'm sure they are fascinating. Yeah. In terms of research and genetic studies and cultural studies and whatnot. Kind of like living fossils. They are directly descended from all of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Not much gene diversity to like change. Apart from the great Andamanese, there were three other major tribes on the Andaman Islands. The Onge, the Jarava, and the Jungil. These groups did not get along with the Andamanese tribes. 
and often slaughtered each other when they were forced to occupy close quarters by the British encroachment of their lands. This always happens. Mm-hmm. To the British, they're all indigenous. One big tribe, go live, go live next to each other. We need half the island for our activities. I mean, they don't like each other. Why should they live next to each other? There was a lot of bloodshed, local wars among those tribes to kill each other because they had historically never gotten along. This had devastating effects on the population of all of these native people. And by 1906, the Jungil tribe was completely extinct. There were no living members of that tribe. The territories of these tribes are close to each other, and so they have knowledge of their neighbors. They had contact with each other, albeit hostile. However, the slight mm-hmm. distance from the mainland ensured that the Sentinelli had some isolation from all of these interactions taking place. Okay. All of these other tribes, they live in close quarters, and they even if they hated each other, they knew of each other. Yeah. The Sentinelli, however seem to be immune to all these local politics somehow they were like screw this crap we're out of here leave us alone it sounds like my kind of people (laughs) can i join i will sacrifice my child to a wolf and that'll get me in oh no alex do not do that you you sound just like one of the idiots we're gonna talk about later in this episode (laughs) So the Sentinelli had lived away and alone for thousands of years because their island was not easily reachable by other tribes and also because they chose to live by themselves. It was kind of 50-50. Some of it was out of their hands and some of it they had decided for themselves. Okay. The Brits at this point were getting fed up with the constant attacks and raids into their settlements by the Greater Andamanese and the Jarawa tribes. And so they started to shoot and kill them more often and captured many younger tribe members to garner as much information as they could about them. I think this is just the only reason why Dutch and Britishers were able to colonize all over the world. They had guns. Yeah. If you put (laughs) swords or bows and arrows and spears into their hands, they would have been wiped out on day one. But the guns... Unfair advantage. Yeah, it was in a level playing field at all. In 1867, a ship called the Ninve ran aground on the shores of the Sentinel Island. Now we're back on Sentinel Island. So this ship ran aground right outside of Sentinel Island, stranding 106 crew members on the shore, where they were attacked by the native tribesmen promptly. Shit. Somehow the crew was able to fend them off long enough to survive, and they were rescued by the Royal Navy. Wow. Yeah. Maurice Vidal Portman was a British administrator who set off an expedition to explore the Sentinel Island and its natives in January of 1885. But why? (laughs) They had nothing to do, because back in 1771, I believe, Some guy made a map and he drew that out. There's an island there. There are lights there. We need to find out, you know, what resources they have that we can steal. Mm. He was warned. So Portman was warned by the Andamanese tribesmen on the mainland about the hostility of the people on Sentinel Island. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So they had been hostile long enough to be known. And it's not just for outsiders. They were probably hostile to other tribesmen as well, not just Mm -hmm. to colonizers or white people or whatever. So when Portman landed, him and his crew managed to trek through the dense jungle and discovered several small abandoned villages with huts and campfires. In one such village, they found two elderly sentinelli and four children. After a couple days of waiting for the rest of the tribe to show up, Portman decided to just take these six individuals with him back to Port Blair. Oh, yeah. Let's just let's just take them. (laughs) Why did he take them? Like, this is kidnapping, isn't it? Why, Portman? Oh, hey, is this where you live? Not anymore, bitch. (laughs) Come with me. I have Snickers. No, what's a British candy? Mm, Cadbury's. I have Cadbury's. (laughs) The mingling of these tribal elders with the outsiders swiftly made them sick and they died within days. Like, their immunity. (gasps) 
is really? thousands of years old. Yeah, they don't have oh, immunity yeah. to any of the diseases of that time. And when I'm saying diseases, I'm not talking about smallpox or polio. I'm talking about the common cold. Yeah, the flu. They can die. Yep. Alarmed by this development, Portman decided to send the sentinel children right back to the island with a pile of gifts to hopefully appease the tribe. And <laughs> just, like, kill all of them, <laughs> right? Oh, my God. What's a good price on uh, grandparents these days? Like, here, 10 coconuts. Sorry, we killed your grandpa. Oh, we're switching currencies now. We're going for goats. Well, apparently goats is no longer relevant, so I guess we've got to go to the coconut. I'm kind of mad about this. This is so tragic. Yeah. Undermining the lives of a people simply because you are more advanced than them in terms of technology. And the gifts are probably going to get everyone sick. And more mad. You killed our parents and now you're giving us gifts? Get the f*** out. Yeah. No, thank you, Portman. So even though Portman comes across as a great character in this current paragraph, Mm -hmm. he was actually protective about the indigenous populations and had a more benevolent stance towards them than his successors and peers. Yeah, I mean, he cared that they died, I guess. Who else would have made that perilous journey back to the island to put the kids back? Yeah. He bothered, so, you know, okay, he's not a complete a jerk. Uh, no, but, like, probably he just didn't want to deal with the kids. Like, the grandparents were brought along to take care of the children, and then they died. So he was like, ah, shit, what am I going to do with these little children? You think he thought that this would bait the rest of the tribe to get their boats out or whatever and, you know, make it to Port Blair? What was his point? I don't know. Or maybe he thought he could talk to the kids and glean their culture from them. I literally think he just, like, didn't want to have to take care of them. Because, like, the grandparents are dead. The grandparents are the ones who are supposed to handle the situation so Mm -hmm. that the children can just be observed. I don't know. Portman made several quick excursions from 1885 to 1887 to the Sentinel Island leaving gifts for the inhabitants every time and hoping for a more peaceful contact. What kind of gifts is he giving? Coconuts, a spoon, I don't know, like an umbrella, something, shoes, shoelaces. Blankets. They mostly left... um, Pots and pans. Yeah, pots and pans and food items. So bananas, coconuts, things like that. Tinned foods. One escaped convict from Port Blair is known to have made his way to North Sentinel Island in 1896. Two others with him drowned on the reef surrounding the island. The lone survivor's luck did not hold. He was killed by the Sentinelese and left on the beach where his body was spotted and retrieved by a visiting British party. Whenever a large number of visitors threatened a landing, the islanders took to their forests and did not return to the beaches unless the intruders had left. So that's probably what happened when Portman had gone in. They saw the approaching ship and they're like, hurry to the forest, everyone goes, climb a tree and don't come out. Go hide. In 1967, and this is post-independence, okay, India is now a republic, there's democracy on the mainland. There are now departments for study and research. There's an anthropology department, an archaeology department, and they're all excited Mm. to go out and venture out into these islands. So in 1967, a group of 20 people comprising the governor, armed forces, and naval personnel were led by Triloknath Pandit, an Indian anthropologist working for the Anthropological Survey of India, or ASI to the island to explore it and befriend the Sentinelese. Through binoculars, the group saw several clusters of Sentinelese along the coastline. They retreated into the forest as the team advanced into shallow waters. The team followed their footprints and after about 0.6 miles or so, they found a group of 18 huts made from grass and leaves that showed signs of recent occupation and there were still burning fires at the corners of the hut. So. Clearly, they had abandoned their village in a hurry when they saw these people coming. Mm -hmm. The team discovered raw honey, skeletal remains of pigs, wild fruits, and adze. It's some kind of a tool that looks like um, 
a backhoe or a hoe used for yeah, farming. Yeah. So they had mm-hmm. a tool like that. A multi-pronged wooden spear, bows, arrows, cane baskets, fishing nets, bamboo pots, and wooden buckets. Metal working was okay. evident. The team failed to establish any contact and just withdrew from the island, leaving gifts on the shores. So this was the first time an official party from India had gone to make contact, but they failed because the tribe just went and hid, which I think was perfect. That's better than that's better than them coming out. That's probably good for the explorers. Exactly. In early 1974, a National Geographic film crew went to the island with a team of anthropologists accompanied by armed police to film a documentary called Man in Search of Man. The team was met with arrows and a spear impaled deep into the thigh of the director, Prem (laughs) Vaidya. This time, clearly, they were like, they weren't patient, like with the last This is the Hannibal, this is the cannibal holocaust moment. (laughs) Is this what happens in the movie? I think there's a film crew that goes into the Amazon and they get captured and then one chick gets impaled. There's not even that much cannibalism. You think it was inspired by this incident? This was in 74. Big potential. Oh, well, actually, there were several such expeditions taking place in the Amazon. Yeah. It's probably inspired from there. So during the 1970s and 80s, Trilok not funded the anthropologist. He undertook several visits to the island. Sometimes the sentinelies waved. Sometimes they turned their backs and assumed a defecating posture. (laughs) What? Wait, what? If they see a ship approaching them, they'd sit with their butts. They're mooning the ship, basically. (laughs) Awesome. That's a pretty clear message. We think you are poop. Get out of here. We think of you and we want to poo. (laughs) Please go away. (laughs) If you're wondering what it is, we think that you is she (laughs) so Pandit took this as a sign of their not being welcome well he's a genius this man is a genius other obscene gestures were seen in response to contact parties such as swaying of penises (laughs) and jumping up and down with spears in their hands I'm a big fan of this form of communication it's so clear. There's no yeah. there's no gray area. Some things in humanity also just don't change since the Neolithic period. It's like some messages just stay the same. These things I've seen so many times in Bollywood movies. These are just dance moves. Yeah. These are just Bollywood dance moves now. <gasps> so in 1981, a ship called MV Primrose carrying a bulk cargo of chicken feed from Bangladesh to Australia, ran aground in rough seas just off of North Sentinel Island. Oof. The crew was safely airlifted after a few days. So, few. Good for them. But a salvage crew was given the contract to salvage whatever they could off of the ship. The crew visited the island over a period of 18 months to dismantle and haul away as much of the ship as they could. Uh They had several visits from the Sentinelese, a couple of times every single month. They were placated with bananas, and they were allowed to scavenge whatever small metal parts they wanted for their arrow tips. So there was no hostility. They were curious about what was going on. Uh They would, you know, come in their little canoes, climb up the ship, look around the ship and pick up whatever pieces of metal they could. All they wanted was metal off of the ship. Yeah. If you look at Google Earth at the Sentinel Island, you can see the Mm -hmm. remains of the ship right off of the island even now. Wow. So the Sentinelese didn't just attack indiscriminately. They must have seen the salvage crew working with tools and stuff and understood that these weren't invaders or warriors, but were tradesmen. And thus, not a big threat to them. I mean, this is just my speculation. In 1991, so we're coming another decade into the future, a contact party landed on the shores with sacks full of coconuts, which the tribe values highly, since they don't grow on the island. That's weird. A group of sentinelly 
lined up on the shore with bows and arrows pointed at the boats. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everything was really tense. The crew on the boat had no idea how this is going to go. In the 70s, the director got a spear in his thigh. So yeah. they, they can kill you if they want to. Their aim mm -hmm. is impeccable. So everything was tense. There was a standoff. At the last minute, Just before the leader was about to let go of the arrow into the boat, a sentinel woman stepped forward and pushed his bow away. After that, everyone else buried their bows into the sand. Why did she do that? <gasps> Matriarch? She had spotted something different in this expedition. This time, there was a woman on board. The woman was anthropologist Madhumala Chattopadhyay. Before this, the government did not allow women to be part of any such expeditions, and she had fought for years for the right to do so. That sucks. It seemed like her efforts were bearing fruit that day. The presence of a woman had indicated something to the sentinel. A subliminal peace treaty had taken place. I live for this moment. It is such a beautiful instance of positive female energy right through and through isn't it yeah totally and also yes the woman was in charge which is amazing <laughs> yeah it's always you gotta get women involved to stop the nonsense for hours the island people came up in the shallow waters to the boats and took coconuts by hand from the team of anthropologists this had never happened before they danced and smiled and seemed happy to see these strange visitors Mm. Such friendly visits continued every year till 1994 when they were suddenly halted by the government altogether to prevent further harm coming to the tribes like disease and, of course, loss of culture. Mm -hmm. There is video um, of this visit, by the way, on YouTube. You can look it up and it's really cool. You can see how they come up to the boats and they take the coconuts and stuff. Uh, you can see that the women are totally in control and they are the ones telling the men to like go forward and pick stuff up and come back. We've had enough. Let's go. That's crazy. They were clearly in control. The Andamanese tribes was a patriarchal tribe. All of the tribes like the Jarava, the Yonge, the Andamanese were patriarchal where women were submissive. They were completely under the control of mm -hmm. the men. It seems like this island, things things work very differently. Sometimes you need to rein in that testosterone and you need the presence of a woman to kind of be like, hey, stop this nonsense. Well, you just need some rational minded humans to be involved to calm down all the hysterics of the other gender. We are called the emotional beings, aren't we? I think that's what the world needs. That's like the ultimate projection that has happened in the history of our time. So you want to watch a little bit like a clip of this contact? Yeah, sounds so cool. So let's watch a little bit of it. Finally, a film with full frontal male nudity. Yeah, it sure is because they don't really wear any clothes. They do wear um, something that looks like a corset. I think it's leaves and straw corset like around their chest yes hmm. you gotta watch your figure out there in the islands interesting like what is it for to protect the core like that's where your heart is that's where your core is oh maybe so let me share my screen and we can watch this little clip oh that must have been so crazy what is he doing is he dancing Yeah, he's dancing. So the anthropologist on the boat is dancing to try and convey that we're a bunch of jolly old people. We're just here to have fun. We're goofy. Oh, this guy looks ripped. We don't mean no harm. What is he doing? Is he like signaling them to come over? I think he's just looking at him, like trying to figure out what to do. Oh, yeah. No, I thought I saw him waving his hand. Okay, so there's a ripped dude on the beach. And he's got a ripped buddy in the background, and they're just... And probably another couple dozens of ripped people <laughs> hiding in the trees. They should call it <laughs> Ripped Island. They are fit. They're really dark. They are Negrito people, so, like, as close to African origin as you can imagine. Okay. Oh. 
oh, the boobies of reason have showed up. Yep. See how she's dragging him back? She's like, hell no, get out of here. It's not safe. He's like, I just want to go see the coconut. I just want some coconut. She drug him away. Oh, that is so funny. Wives. So this isn't the story you were talking about with the line of them getting ready to shoot. This is after that event. Okay, okay. Oh, and the coconuts are coming in. So they're throwing coconuts one by one to the shore and... Man, these people know what's up. Coconut is my favorite snack. It's so good for you. Yeah, it's got water in it. It's got a little treat. You can use the shell as a bowl, wear it as a hat. It's like one of the most multi-purpose foods out there, I would argue. So look, they have like a necklace. They have a headband. Mm -hmm. They have a waistband. Yeah. In which they've got some kind of dagger. But yeah, no pants, no shirt, nothing to cover. What modern human would consider naked? Have you ever seen this movie, uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy? It's one of my favorites. You have to wonder if the coconut poses a similar, like, Coca-Cola bottle dilemma. <laughs> nah, nah. They've got enough to share. Oh, look at that dagger. That looks deadly. You guys got to check this out. That was so cool. What did you think about that, Alex? That was awesome. Like when you see them, it hits you how primitive or close to Stone Age men they really were. Like their appearance, their lack of clothing, their tools and weapons or whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, you see like if we removed all of that bullshit, we wouldn't look that different. We, I mean, we'd all be way ripped or we'd be more ripped. We'd be swole. Life would be much simpler, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. Better, maybe? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. So as we saw in this video, like, um, the anthropologists chucked coconuts and sack full of coconuts for hours at, and the people came and picked them up, and they danced and smiled, and they seemed happy to see these strange visitors. Yeah. Which was a promising sign. Mm -hmm. So something must have clicked. Something, I guess, whoever that one female tribe member was um, who said, okay, let's try being friendly, you know, instead of being hostile. Maybe they were living in a period where they didn't have enough resources. Did they have some kind of drought yeah. or all the animals died and the fruits didn't grow? I don't know what it was, but they were maybe desperate in that moment and needed a helping hand. Mm -hmm. And they decided, let's do it. Let's take a chance and see what, what this boat full of people has for us. I wonder what they smell like. Is that weird? I bet they smell salty. Salty, yeah, right? Maybe sweaty. Yeah, a bit musky. That's mm. a weird question. Maybe they smell like bananas. Maybe those like clothes yeah. that they were wearing were fragranced. The thing is, when you live out in the wild, you don't want to smell good because then you just look like a buffet of all kinds of bugs. <laughs> True. <gasps> Such friendly visits continued every year till 1994 when the government halted these kind of expeditions altogether to prevent further harm coming to the isolated tribes, things like diseases and, of course, the inevitable loss of culture and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you were talking about, The like the Coke bottle in Gods Must Be Crazy. <laughs> they must have seen that movie and they're like, oh, shit. That's when the government got a copy of the movie and they're like, wait a minute, we're doing this right now. My mom freaking loves that movie. Maybe the like Indian government was also moved. We must protect these people. At the same time, as you said before, there's just like tons and tons of sea trash floating towards them. So yeah, they must have some origin story about those things, those objects that they found. Oh, that would be cool to hear what they're like conception of these outside plastic bottles visitors. no no no. the humans on the boats and like what they think of all of that remember at the beginning when i said that we will talk about ufos and aliens again oh yeah doesn't this sound exactly like how we perceive the visits of extraterrestrials on earth they are an advanced civilization and they're here just to observe us, watch us and see how we're doing. But they don't want to contact us because that might upset our way of life. We are the aliens. We are the aliens in this story. That's yeah. Amazing. 
That's so exciting. Think about it because <laughs> as I was typing up this episode, it hit me. I'm like, damn it, this is exactly what they would feel probably, right? They're yeah. like, ah, these poor fools. Yeah, yeah. They're living such a primitive way of life. I wonder who's wondering what we smell like. <laughs> Pretty bad. <laughs> Going by all of the perfume I smell when I go out, I'm like, ah, oh, please. <gasps> one spray is enough. Oh, yes, Stop it at totally one. Overdo it. <sighs> That's exactly what aliens would do. They would observe from a distance. Mm-hmm. Maybe throw some crumbs at us, little bits of information. Yeah. Every millennia or so. Teach us how to do certain things, but then move back, step back into the mm-hmm. shadows and be like, here, go do your thing. Go do it yourself. We don't want to we don't want to reveal everything to you. We're going to keep all those mm-hmm. all this nice technology to ourselves. After the 2004 tsunami, by the way, th- there was a major tsunami at yeah. that time in Indonesia, Thailand. It devastated all of these areas in Southeast Asia. And it also destroyed large parts of South India. And of course, islands out in the Bay of Bengal would have been affected as well. And so the government of India did surveys via helicopter to check up on these tribes. They seem to have survived just fine, still full of vigor and hostility as before, because they shot iron-tipped arrows at the helicopter. No! Yeah, they were doing just fine. And that iron tip, that's salvaged. Yes, that's all salvaged, probably from that ship that was shipwrecked back in the 80s. That's enough metal probably for that group of people to live on for centuries, right? They're only using it to hunt. And when they're hunting, they retrieve their arrows. Mm -hmm. They get them right back. So yeah, it's going to last them. If they last another thousand years, they'll be there just fine. In 2006, two fishermen from Kerala, India, got drunk just outside the waters of Sentinel Island and they passed out on their boat. Several other fishing trawlers spotted their drifting boat and tried to warn them to get away from the island. But they Mm. were too drunk and were in no condition to maneuver their boat consciously. So when their little boat hit the shores of Sentinel Island, they were promptly killed by the tribe and buried on the beach. Damn. So even though there were some friendly contacts made in the 90s, Mm -hmm. whatever generation is now in power is again hostile. Interesting. Because they can't possibly have long lifespans, I imagine. I don't know. They probably live till they're 30 or 40. I wonder if they have the same like feral child worm syndrome. I don't imagine anyone lives past 40 out here. So... From the 90s to 2006, everyone that was old enough back then is either dead or or really old. Control definitely changed hands. And so now they're hostile again. Okay. The most recent and most infamous incident of contact was that of an American missionary called John Allen Chow. This is how I've heard of this group, I think. OutsiderOnline.com has an excellent article on this terrible mission that ultimately led to John Allen Chow's death. And that's what I'm using as source for the rest of the episode. Okay. So John Chow was born to parents who lived and worked in an evangelical environment. So the schools that their parents studied in, the schools that they studied in were all um, evangelical-based. And although John's father who was a Chinese immigrant um, and a psychologist by profession, was a very rational medical doctor. And by all accounts, he had a great childhood full of outdoor adventures. Somehow, after reading Robinson Crusoe as a child, John forged an obsession with living on an island, swinging from the trees, eating fruit, and living off of the land all on his own in the wild. I mean, I get that. I have had the same fantasy to this day. This is our Mowgli fantasy all over again. Yep. I need a wolf, mama. So in his late teens, he had read way too many glorified accounts of missionary expeditions, um, like that of John Livingston, which typically led to the deaths of the protagonists in the story. Hmm. And these deaths were often hailed, you know, as... Martyrdoms? 
yeah, martyrdoms in the service of God. So they were seen as heroes in these evangelical circles. That's ridiculous. Yikes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, doesn't this sound kind of like terrorism and cultish brainwashing? Yeah, it sounds like a jihad type of thing. So he was part of a Christian evangelical cult called All Nations, which trained him to do some very bad and very dumb stuff like this. The missionary training by All Nations included navigating a mock native village populated by the missionary staff members who were dressed up as hostile natives, wielding fake spears and arrows and bows, and he had to pretend that he he's befriending them, kind of like a drill, like a mock drill. Okay. This sounds so... I want to know what the approach was. I want to see the simulations. (laughs) This is like LARPing. Yeah. This is like really bad LARP. I want to see like the group of white evangelical Christians dressing up as like, you know, indigenous people and pretending to be hostile and hostile and yeah. Playing really hard to get. And then obviously coming around (laughs) and being like, oh, yes, Jesus, thank you. I know what that script probably looked like. John walks into this hostile tribe. So, <laughs> get out of here. We are infidels or whatever. You know, we are damned. Our souls are going straight to hell. We are Satan's minions. We have no knowledge of God. In comes John with a Bible and he goes, Jesus loves you. And suddenly there's oh. like flowers yeah, exactly. falling from the sky and butterflies everywhere. And they're like, <laughs> We believe you and we love you. We are now saved. Thank you. And he gets a damn medal for his performance. Dumb. So John had visited many countries to spread the word of his religion. And he had visited Andaman twice before in 2015 and 2016. In 2018, he returned even more adamant on making contact with this tribe of savages untouched by the light of his benevolent mission. He bribed some fishermen $300 to take him near the reef of the island. This was illegal, by the way. Mm -hmm. The Coast Guard of India patrols that area. Okay. If you're caught, you're going to go to jail. So he had to bribe these fishermen to take him there. Yeah. And $300 is a lot of money Mm -hmm. for these fishermen who have such an uncertain means of income. Yeah. So I don't blame them. Yes, they broke the law and they should be treated accordingly, but I sympathize with them. They took the risk. This is in 2018, sometime in November. Okay. So John then took his kayak with fish and other instruments and landed on Sentinel Island at night. He exclaimed to the tribes people who were watching him curiously, My name is John. Jesus loves you. Oh my God. Jesus Christ gave me authority to come to you. Here is some fish. Uh-huh. Um, John, they live on a freaking island yeah. for at least 20,000 years. They got plenty of fish. They have fucking fish, John. <laughs> and also, it's just so ridiculous to, like, come up and speak, just say some nonsense in a language that they won't remotely remote. Like, like what an illusion of grandeur this guy must have had. So I thought a lot about it. Like, he suffered from something. I don't know if it was narcissism or solipsism or something in between. (laughs) But he really didn't get that the world doesn't revolve around him and his beliefs. Yeah. What did he think? Jesus was just going to, like, make them understand him? I think he really did believe that. That's fun. And that's where the brainwashing part comes in. Mm Mm-hmm. He returned the next day with a bunch of supplies and gifts like scissors, tweezers, a multi-tool, ropes, towels, fishing hooks, a first aid kit, and other small items that these people may have appreciated. He reached the shallows and two men came to see him. They quickly picked up the fish that he threw at them Mm -hmm. and were smiling. It appeared that all was going well. John felt a little encouraged. Okay. It really wasn't though. Oh boy. Was it like a gorilla smile where actually it was like a show of uh, aggression? No, the men were perfectly happy with the situation. But then a woman and small child appear on the shore. Okay. From what we've seen before, (laughs) the women seem to wield all the power on this island. Yeah. He pointed a bow and arrow drawn in John's direction. 
aimed directly the at child? his chest. Yes, the child. Oh my God. John got out of his kayak and he started to preach to the kid about Genesis and whatnot. Oh, good. The kid listened maybe for a few minutes and then shot his arrow directly into John's directly wait the kid shot his arrow promptly in the direction of John's heart <laughs> okay did he get him John had his bible in front of him right because he was trying to show them the bible so the bible blocked his shot okay. and thankfully it saved his life so John immediately scrambled back into the ocean yeah he abandoned his kayak and he swam a mile to get back to the fisherman's boat anchored off of the coast. Okay. So most sensible, rational people would take this as a clear sign. I think I am not welcome. I have the impression that maybe these people don't want me here. Yeah, but to John, it was a challenge. He wrote in his journal, Lord... Is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have even had a chance to hear your name? <sighs> These are the thoughts going through his mind, okay, after being shot at. Oh, I can't wait for this guy to die. Is that bad? That is bad, but then he asked for it. We, we didn't make him do this. He did have rational thoughts, though, but they seem clouded and overshadowed by what seemed like a burden beyond his capability of alleviating. I think this mission entrusted upon him was weighing heavily on him. His ego took over and the can-do, will-do attitude vetoed all his rational thoughts. Oh, good. John's gut was telling him that he would not survive. He wrote, Watching the sunset, and it's beautiful. I'm crying a bit. I'm wondering if it'll be the last sunset I ever see before being in the place where the sun never sets. Is he trying to commit suicide? Suicide by sentinel, please? <laughs> I think he feels like it's out of his hands. What an idiot. Because he writes, if I leave, I believe I'll have failed the mission. So it really seems like the rational part of him was telling him to get out of there. But then all the brainwashing from the cult yeah. was weighing heavily on him. And he felt yeah. like he didn't have a way out. And that he had to do this in the name of God. Because in his mind, the mission is God's mission. And you can't say no to God. That's what yeah. he felt. So, When you put it that way, and I remind that like evangelicalism is just a cult and everyone in it is more or less brainwashed. Then I start to feel bad. You made me feel bad, Pia. Now I feel bad. Oh, he was a victim in this. I was having so much fun waiting for him to die and feeling self-righteous. And now I just feel bad. Yeah, I'm sad for him because his family loved him and his parents really did try to talk him out of it. His father tried many times to convince him not to go and do things like this. But when your child is an adult and brainwashed brainwashed you you really don't have control over that situation okay well i blame the church more than i blame the sentinelese for whatever's about to happen then oh absolutely the sentinelese are totally innocent i don't blame them one bit john was heartbroken that the child had shot at him despite his love and soul saving charity mm -hmm. it's almost as if he was unable to comprehend that people can live and be totally happy and thrive in the absence of religion and outside of the boundaries of one's personal world view. It's sad. They didn't even realize that's what he was there to do. They just imagine that situation. This guy, he brings a bunch of stuff, but he starts, he's just talking and talking and waving some weird object in your face and approaching your child. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It sounds scary. It sounds more hostile than, yeah. than the Sentinelli because Sentinelli would give you a chance. They'd raise the arrow and wait. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're shooting at you at once. They're giving you a chance. They're warning you, like, listen, we don't like it. Get out of here. He clearly doesn't get the message. Okay, this thing might be more dangerous than, mm -hmm. more aggressive than we are. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's sad, but he was an adult, not an ignorant child. On November 16th, the 26-year-old pre-med student, John Allen Chow, was dropped off by the boat on the shore 
and he walked into the sentinelly encampment, hoping to drive out Satan from this innocent group of people. A group of people who had lived here for millennia mm-hmm. before the first mentions of all the gods we have ever heard of were made. Mm-hmm. John's body was seen by the fishermen after a few hours being dragged by the men onto a beach. He was buried there under the sand. They buried him? They buried him. That's kind of interesting. So even the two fishermen before this were buried in the sand. That seems to be how they... Get rid of the bodies. Yeah, their last rites were burying in the sand. Sand burial. Interesting. Indian rescuers were called and they tried to collect the body but were understandably met with hostility. Mm -hmm. They abandoned the operation eventually, considering it too risky and likely to lead to violence. The fishermen were arrested for illegally traversing into protected waters. Okay. That's sad, but, you know, they have to pay the price. Mm -hmm. Today, more than a century after the first known landing, the Sentinelese are still the undisputed lords of their island. They have been on their own for far too long. We don't know what they call themselves. What do they think of when they wake up? And what do they dream of when they close their eyes at night? And that's the end of the episode on the Sentinelly people. What do you think, Alex? Ooh, that's kind of a spooky ending. We don't know what they did to John. We know that they killed him, but we don't know how or... Like, what happened in the moments between him going on to shore and him departing the the earth? Yeah, I think he definitely just walked in there preaching to them in a loud voice and, you know, I love you, I love you. And they're like, dude, get out. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Well, dang. Leave the Sentinelese alone. Yeah, they're happy. I really like that the government did that and that they are left alone i don't know if there's like some ethical issue about depriving people of the modern conveniences Mm -hmm. medical and technological etc but live and let live i guess you know you don't know what you don't know Mm -hmm. and what you don't know can't hurt you whatever it may be that they are lacking in their primitive lives They don't seem to care about it. They haven't needed it till now. They've been thriving for thousands of years. They'll thrive for another thousands of years. We are the ones who are in trouble. As long as no one brings the plague over there. Exactly. Just leave them alone and let them be. Because as we saw in all of the other tribes from the Andaman Islands, any form of contact, even if the intention was benevolent, Ended in the extinction of the people. Yeah. They died out because they no longer were able to sustain lifestyles that were healthy. Mm -hmm. They were being given rations by the government. They were given rice Mm -hmm. and sugar and tobacco and alcohol. And that just ruined them. That ruined them. They no longer hunted. They no longer gathered. From one generation to the other, there was a huge loss of information and knowledge and native culture was lost Mm -hmm. and so slowly with every generation their numbers kept dropping yeah the jungil tribe went extinct the onge tribe i think they only have 20 or 30 families living now okay jaravas live on reserved land in andamans by themselves but there is a huge tarred road that runs right through the middle of their reserve called the Andaman Trunk Road. People can drive right there and look at them. Mm -hmm. And there is tourism, unofficial, illegal tourism, where you can go and watch the Jarava in their natural habitat. Okay. It's going to ruin them eventually. This road needs to be closed and let them be. Just let them live. Let them live. Let Mm -hmm. them live. Seriously, though. I'm looking right now at a photo of like some people on one of the Andaman Islands. I don't know which island. Is it Jarava? Maybe. It's a picture of a guy. He's half in the water and he has a bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. And the arrow is definitely taller than him. Whoa. Like it's a freaking spear that is on a bow. 
It's a spear spear arrow. It's crazy. So a lot of the footage I saw of the other tribes, they would fish like that with bows and arrows. Yeah, yeah. That's what it looks like it would be good for fishing. That's our episode on the Sentinelese on their little island out in the Andamans. Yeah. You know, this is a lesson. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily always have the best perspective on everything. People have their own beliefs, their own lies. Just let them live. Live and let live. Yeah. This applies to everyone. We don't need to do any more colonizing. That trend is long dead, people. Mm -hmm. Let it die. That brings us to Bollywood Corner. So this is, again, a hard topic to find movies for. And I remembered that I'd watched a Tamil movie a long back, I think 20... 13, 2014 or something, called Ayurithil Uruvan. This is one of my meh recommendations for today. It's a popcorn movie. Like, do not try and find sense in this. It is definitely a masala movie okay. with tons of songs and emotional mm-hmm. drama, unnecessary villains, etc. in there. It's a Maggie masala movie. I mean, I enjoyed it. I watch movies like that on and off, but... To people who don't watch Desi movies, I would say, yeah, it's all right. You don't need this one. You might get a little frustrated. But the story is interesting and certainly different from the usual lot. Kind of like an Indiana Jones film. The lead characters, who are women, by the way, which is great, are searching for some lost tribe and treasure, etc. And they encounter several mystical supernatural puzzles on this remote island before they find this lost tribe, and they learn about their history. Check it out. It's okay. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I like the premise. I pretty much will be vaguely interested in anything that happens in like island or tropical land just to get the vibes. So the second movie I'm recommending today is Newton or Newton, like Isaac Newton, okay. but not about him, obviously. This movie isn't about lost tribes or mysterious island dwellers. Uh, Newton is a stoic look at the reality of life for India's tribal population who straddle their traditional way of life out in the wild and the promise of a better life with modernization. The movie is amazing. It has stellar performances by Rajkumar Rao and Pankaj Tripathi, both of whom are character actors. Yeah. So if you see any movie with these two guys, just watch it. Okay. So this movie is about how an honest and strong-willed election officer who is assigned to conduct elections in a tribal area inside of the jungle, he is determined to conduct elections in the jungles just so that the local tribal population can come in and vote Mm -hmm. despite the threat from Naxal rebel groups who have power in that area. Okay. And Pankaj Tripathi plays the role of a cop who is assigned to protect this election booth in the jungle. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. This movie is great for both Desi and non-Desi audiences because there's no nonsense in this movie whatsoever. Okay. So take a look at Newton. I think it's on Netflix or at least on Prime or something. Super interesting. Yeah. Watch that. And there's always Cannibal Holocaust. Not Indian. (laughs) Not appropriate. But pretty wild, and it will, like, feed the true crime, not even true crime, just the horror, the, like, crappy bee horror. I'm going to have to watch this one, Cannibal Holocaust. All I right. think you're going to hate it. You're going to hate it. I might. Ooh, okay. Oh, well, how about we just rewatch Gods Must Be Crazy? That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just watch that. Good family fun. Mm-hmm. I hope you enjoyed this little trip to the Andamans, and you found... Something in there that was intriguing and piqued your curiosity. I think I learned that if I just want people to get away from my house, I'm going to go outside naked and like wag my butt at them until they go away. (laughs) Buy a fake penis and just... (laughs) That's what I was thinking. Or what was the other thing they did? They Um, squatted in pooping pose. Defecating pose. Well, said people running. (laughs) <laughs> just moon everyone <laughs> please rate and review us on apple 
podcasts or is that iTunes? I don't know what it's called, but rate and review us there. I think it's iTunes for the reviewing. Please tell your friends and your family about Crimes from the East. We would love if you could just send the link of Spotify or, you know, whatever you listen to us. Send it along in those WhatsApp groups. I know you have one. I know there are groups for every family in WhatsApp. Just send it to them. Everyone has a true crime junkie friend, too. And this isn't even like a true, true crime podcast, honestly. Like, we're yeah. going to start covering just the whole strange world of stuff that happens. <laughs> Any of your English friends who have some, like, weird support for the English colonization of <laughs> India, definitely send them this. And, like, highlight all the points where we call them <laughs> white devils, white bastards, colonial dickbags. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Spread the word, you guys. And let's chat. Tell me what you want to hear. What do you want the next episode to be on? I always look for true crime stories and then I'm like, everyone already knows about this. Is there any point to us covering a case that's been done to death? Well, we always have our spin on it, so it's not totally pointless. Yeah, true, true. Check out our Patreon. I did make a Patreon page and I will link it on our website um, under the About section. It is called Crimes from the East with no spaces. So you can find us on patreon.com slash crimes from the East. Be the first to patronize us on Patreon. We will send you an autographed photo of... I don't want to offer an autographed photo of ourselves because it could be like some weird person. We're going to make stickers and merch soon, so if you're our first Patreon subscriber, we'll send you free merch whenever we actually make it. And really good stuff, because Alex does some of our artwork, and it looks amazing. Aw, thanks. Yeah, I did mock-ups on, like, t-shirts and coffee mugs and all kinds of goodies, and it looks so good. Cool. And I have a bunch of different tiers that you can join under the lowest one starts at one dollar a month which is very reasonable i think yeah <laughs> one dollar gets you pretty much nothing these days but you can get a little more of alex and i yep so i upload pictures there and i do also upload uncut episodes sometimes so there's a lot of stuff i cut out of episodes just because getting too long or it's too bizarre or scandalous or <laughs> just offensive. I cut it out for general distribution, but I leave it in and put it up on Patreon. So if you want to hear all that jazzy stuff in each episode, become a patron. A Patreon. Become a Patreon. Um, we're also going to start putting our Masala Times episodes up there, I think, right? We're going to release... Two every month, we'll do one of them public and the second episode will go on Patreon. So that's another little extra you can get if you become a patron, patron saint. Become our patron saint. Come on. Yeah, patron saint of Podcast Island. That's about all the spiel we had for you today. All right. Join us again next week on another episode of Crimes from the East. Your true crime podcast with a little masala. Masala and inspired. Namaste. Namaste.